Mix in the Dark. Hey, what's up? It's my Yang from Mix in the Dark. We are on our very final part of Karen Hill Memories. Once again, thank you, Jubilee, for allowing me to be the voice of your stories. It has truly been an honor. I want to give a quick shout out to Aiden. He is one of my younger listeners, and I met him this past weekend when I was picking up my niece and nephew to go to Severs Fall Festival. When I meet people spontaneously like this, I feel like my brain freezes and I forget that I am the voice of Mix in the Dark. But he was so cute and kind to me. I hope you hear this episode because it's for you. Speaking of meeting young listeners, I want to let you know that I am volunteering for a trunk or treat event that one of my good friends from Cypherside Dance School is co-hosting. They are partnering up with other local businesses in that area, such as Right Path to Miracle, Warm and Muay Thai, and Mong House Restaurant and Banquet. There will be things like food trucks, bounce houses, raffles, and of course treats from our trunk or treat lineup. I'll put up my Mix in the Dark flag so that you know how to find me. Come grab a treat and a picture with me. I hope to see you there. With that said, let's get started with our last part of Karen Hill Memories. Please enjoy. Children on the Stairs Children have always been a common sight at the Karen Hill house, along with its troubled history and dark memories that echoed in its walls. But the subject of spirits, ghosts, and things that go bump in the night was rarely discussed in front of the younger children. Grandma would firmly squash what she deemed as irresponsible talk. The house was like a stately lady whose facade hid her mysterious past. A stone staircase graced the front of the house, leading to the tiled foyer. Dark teak filled the house, with a central staircase drawing the eye as it climbed up each story. The floors and stairs creaked as they settled down when the humidity of the day gave way to the cool of twilight. I remember Grandma's kitchen with its delicious aroma of nonya curry chicken, curry ke, or my favorite hokkien prawn noodle soup. Those Sunday lunches were family feast days, a combination of Grandma's cooking, carefree fun, and childish laughter. My cousins, Tim and Perry, and my elder sister, Lily, and I used to run wild in the jungle garden, an overgrown leafy wonderland with flowering shrubs. We had loved to play in the bamboo grove near the gates to the property until Grandma told us to stay out of there. Although the Chinese and Japanese considered the bamboo to be an auspicious plant, it's believed that they also attracted wandering spirits. Family legend has it that the property at Cairn Hill was watched over by guardian spirits, who mostly honored an agreement to leave the family in peace. But that did not stop the more sensitive among us from having the occasional experience. Things mainly happened to people not related to the family though, especially those who upset grandma in some way. Tenants who had quarreled with grandma would complain that they felt uncomfortable in their rooms and couldn't sleep. All would leave the house soon afterwards. When I pressed mum for more details, she only said it was little things. Those hapless individuals had a tendency to suffer slight accidents. It was peculiar how they would always trip and fall down. When my parents were first married, they had lived in Karen Hill along with my grandma and other members of the family. It was home to them until my sister Lily turned two. My mother said she always felt quite at ease in the house. She neither saw nor felt anything out of the ordinary in all the years that she lived there. My parents' room was located at the top of the stairs on the third floor. The wooden staircase that adorned the center of the house was wonderfully irresistible to all children, perfect for a splendid romp. Throughout the morning, afternoon, and evening, the family would hear a stampede of children's hoofbeats thundering up and down the stairs. We were an irresponsible horde, a multitude of young cousins aged between 1 to 10. Wherever we went, we were brought raucous laughter and squeals of delight. No amount of scolding or smacks on the rumps could stop us. It was far too much fun. Every child should have a mysterious old house to play in, complete with protective resident spirits. I loved that Karen Hill house, and in some strange way, I felt it loved us back. One afternoon, third uncle Adrian was at the bottom of the staircase on the second floor when he heard what sounded like a herd of buffalo pelting heading up and down the stairs. It was that loud. Looking up with a frown, he was prepared to chase off the horde of nieces and nephews yet again. But it had come from a group of small children with dusky brown skin like Malay. 
They were merrily scampering up and down the staircase. He did not recognize any of them. Uncle Adrian shook his head, not at all impressed. He took them to be children belonging to the neighbors or friends visiting for the day. It was bad enough with the other children in the family. This was no way to behave, especially if they were just guests at the house. They would just have to stop making such an awful ruckus. Be quiet, he told them in his sternest voice. At his reprimand, the children all stopped in their tracks. As one, they turned and faced him. They gave him a strangely considering look. Then they smiled and disappeared. Uncle Adrian was more taken aback than anything else by this encounter. He had thought they were real children playing in front of him. It was not a residual haunting where an after image of a past memory was imprinted and replayed. This seemed to be an intelligent haunting because the children interacted with him. From my uncle's account, they had seemed more mischievous rather than having an ill intent. Were we watched by spirit children as we raced up and down those stairs? The laughter of children and joyful energies had surely filled the house with positive feelings. Our youthful exuberance had been infectious, brightening the spirits of everyone around. Clearly, we were not the only ones who found the staircase a great place to play. Others in the family had also claimed to have heard running feet up and down the staircase, but it was only when my parents were away or not in their room. Either their presence kept things quiet, or there was an otherworldly consensus not to disturb them. Interestingly though, after my parents moved out of the Karen Hill house, just before I was born, the footsteps on the stairs noticeably increased, almost as if the spirit children had been looking for them. Perhaps the children had not meant to be caught playing on the stairs. It seemed to me that they recognized my uncle as being part of the family and decided to do as they were told. I had little success when I tried to look into historical records. Details from the earlier times were sketchy when it came to the juvenile mortality. Singapore was settled by the Sea People, a band of pirates, indigenous sea gypsies or nomads who had used the island as their base. It was called the Masse, the Sea Town, until the 14th century. I wonder if the troop of rowdy children could have belonged to those people. Perhaps they had been the spirits of children waiting to cross over in some stopover junction, got bored and stole away to play. Or by some strange cosmic accident, they had somehow wandered off briefly into another time stream from their own. Scholars of esoteric science have talked about the seven planes or layers of existence, comprising the physical body, breath, mind, intellect, memory, ego, and spirit. Time, and in our consciousness of it, could be flowing in many directions at the same time. The theory goes that in the instances when these planes intersect, we might then experience something out of our usual awareness, such as children mysteriously appearing and disappearing, or people glimpsing scenes from the past or future. Our present could have been their future from the past. Then again, were they truly children at all? Their behavior had been unusually bold and confident for their age. What if they were actually elemental spirits, assuming the playful guise of little ones, so as to blend among the mortals? Another day and another mystery at the Carnell House. Old Man Tree From the 1960s to the 1970s, my sister and I attended school in the Karen Hill area, making our way to a series of rambling old buildings on a hill situated off Orchard Road. Singapore was a different world to the bustling metropolis it is today. It was not as heavily populated nor as crammed with tall buildings along Orchard Road, the main thoroughfare of the CBD. Stately colonial mansions lined that steep incline of road under the dark shade of leafy trees. It was a secluded area with the traffic sounds from Orchard Road dying away almost as soon as we climbed onto the narrow footpath. There was one particular property that always caught my attention as a child. The sprawling, overgrown garden reminded me of my grandmother's place, filled with tall grass, lush banana plants, slender nibong palms, umbrella-shaped flame of the forest, and ansana trees. In the prime spot at the very front, overlooking the path, 
was a huge banyan tree with long, adventitious roots, like a gnarly old man with a trailing beard. It was ancient, over a hundred years old or more, perhaps dating as far back as the days when Singapore was covered with mangrove swamps. This was Old Man Tree. I always thought that Treebeard, the Ent Shepherd of Trees from the Lord of the Rings, would have looked like a banyan. A small wooden structure, complete with a roof and mounted on a platform, dwelt within the curtain of roots. It looked to be a quaint treehouse erected for the children of some wealthy family, abandoned after they had grown up. I was never tempted to wander off the path and venture any closer to explore it. There was something about it that warned me to stay away. From time to time, my classmates whispered vague warnings about Old Man Tree and how that strange little house was haunted. They were never very strong on details, so I had simply dismissed their stories. But I was no stranger to such things, having heard my share of the odd happenings at Grandma's house only a block away. Everything was normal and as it should be when my elder sister Lilia accompanied me to school. There was safety in numbers. But then the year I turned 10, I was rostered in the afternoon school session for primary four. Lily went on to secondary school and her classes were held in the morning. That meant I was left to face Old Man Tree on my own. One day, I was running late for school and hurrying up the hill. It was almost noon and I did not want to be in trouble yet again. As I approached the garden, I heard someone call my name. The voice did not sound familiar, and I could not make out if it was a male or female. It came from the direction of Old Man Tree. There was no one there whom I could see from the footpath. I really did not want to spare it more than a cursory glance. The day was hot and humid, but it was cool in the shade, almost cold for a few seconds. Suddenly, I was very afraid. My senses screamed at me to run. In a panic, I scrambled up the hill as fast as my short legs would take me, expecting at any moment someone or something would grab me from behind. My heart was pounding, my school bag bumping hard into my ribs with every step. But no one stopped me. I ran all the way towards the main school gates. By the time I was seated in class, I managed to convince myself it had just been my imagination. Even so, after that day, just to be on the safe side, I would hasten my footsteps whenever I neared the garden, then I would quickly dash straight past the banyan tree. When nothing else happened for a while, I began to relax, taking my time walking up the hill. Just when I least expected, I began hearing my name called again, quietly, with no one in sight. Unnerved, I would make a run for it. I never stopped, never looked back. For a long while, I did not mention this to my classmates, anyone at school, or even my family. It was easier to tell myself nothing had happened. I simply did not want to think about it. Lily showed me another route to school when I told her I did not like going up that road. This other way took me by the back gates on the far side of the property through the secondary school section. It was a longer, more roundabout way to school, but it enabled me to avoid going near Old Man Tree and that creepy little house. Then my younger sister Kara started primary school and was in turn warned by her schoolmates to beware of the Old Banyan Tree. She came home to tell me about it and we decided to combine forces and question Lily. Lily, remember that Old Banyan near the primary school? I asked. Her look became guarded. Yeah, why? People from school say that the treehouse is haunted, said Kara. Don't listen to those stories, she chided. Kara and I continued to pester Lily until she said, It's a spirit house, that's all. Just then, our mother walked into the room and heard us. Oh, that old place? Your uncle and auntie knew the people there. We learned from mom that our relatives knew the family who used to own that property. They were told that the little spirit house held a shrine erected to Sun Wukong, the monkey god. Forty years on, our old school has long been relocated. The houses and their gardens have been replaced by office buildings and condominiums. I have wondered if it was the spirit of the trickster god who gave me a scare. 
It was quite likely that no harm was intended, but the monkey god is known to be mercurial and prone to mischief, and his sense of humor might not be comfortable for us mere mortals. Perhaps he wanted to give me a hurry up so that I would be in time for school, or was more likely bored and thought it would be fun to see me run. It is still the practice in Indochina and other Southeast Asian countries to provide shelter for the spirits. Offerings will be duly placed there to show respect and appease them in the hope that they will not bring harm to anyone or cause any trouble. Recently, I have heard about a few interesting urban legends from the Bukit Brown and Mount Pleasant areas in Singapore. They include accounts of shamans performing mystical rituals and meditations under banyan trees in the forest, channeling the spirits for occult purposes. They consider the banyan tree to be sacred, with the trailing roots representing the beard of the tree where the spirits are supposed to dwell. Among the local folklore are cautionary tales about children going missing after playing among the banyan trees. They were believed to have been hidden from their families and taken by the spirits. Perhaps it was just as well I ran away. Farewell to the house. For almost 30 years, my grandmother reigned in the colonial house at Kirnhill, which had featured prominently in many of our family stories. The house was sold by the early 1970s. My heart still feels a pang of loss, but children had little choice when it came to such matters. She was a pragmatic woman, having kept her family intact despite the ravages of war. Her new home was going to be a condominium in the Bukit Tima housing estate. For years, the family had a respectful and generally peaceable understanding with the spirits or whatever entities that resided on the property. But it was an arrangement that held as long as the house remained in the hands of the family. After the house was sold and the settlement was completed, Grandma instructed the family to prepare for the move to Bukit Tima. It was quite the exodus. Apart from the furniture from such a big house, there were several people involved, along with a mountain full of belongings. All the upheaval would have stirred up high emotions and restless energy. Third Uncle Adrian was the last one to make the move. He had been expressly instructed by Grandma not to leave things to the last minute. First, Aunt Elsie and second Aunt Maggie had given him earnest warnings as well not to dilly-dally. But Uncle Adrian had never taken the family legend seriously, not even after his own experience with the children on the stairs. No one had really been harmed by anything in the house. He had reasoned that being an adult and well-educated, he was not to be easily off-frightened by the talk of spirits or superstitions. After all, he was an older and wiser man than poor old Lang. He had been too preoccupied with his university studies to do much packing. Long after the rest had left with the removalists, he was still engrossed with stacks of textbooks and study notes. The hours stretched until late in the afternoon with the sun sinking towards the west. My uncle was busy sorting his things into boxes. Many of his belongings were scattered about the graveled driveway in front of the house. Suddenly, he had the unnerving sensation of being surrounded by a host of angry eyes, cold with menace. It would seem that now that the family did not own the house, the resident spirits were not as welcoming. Being made of sterner stuff than most and staunch in his faith in God, Uncle Adrian doggedly continued with his packing. The taxi had just arrived and was on standby, waiting as the boxes were stashed away in the boot. But soon the driver began to look uneasy and asked him not to take too long. Uncle Adrian gritted his teeth and carried on for a while, doing his best to ignore the ominous feeling. Finally, even he could not bear it anymore. Hurriedly, picking up the nearest box, my uncle abandoned the rest of his books and boxes on the driveway and jumped into the waiting taxi. Without a backward glance, he urged the taxi driver to leave the house at Karen Hill. In the late 1960s, property developers had converted a nearby block of luxury flats at Karen Hill Close into the Regency Hotel. 
As part of the development, they had bought Grandma's place, proceeding to demolish the house, courtyard, and kitchen, and bulldozing over the whole property. But not long after excavation work began, my family heard of rumors that human bones had been discovered on the construction site. There were mutterings of other problems as well. Were there people tripping over unseen obstacles? Tools going missing? The newspapers simply reported that the developers were beset by money woes due to several unexpected cost overruns. Plagued by one setback after another, the project came to a screeching halt. The workers downed tools, abandoning the site. Days grew into weeks, weeks became months, which turned to years. Construction work ended up being delayed for 10 years. In 1979, the property was acquired by a Malaysian developer who injected the necessary funds to complete the project. It was renamed the Cairnhill Hotel. It had 11 floors with 180 rooms. Grandma's house, that stately colonial beauty, along with a jungle garden, were buried under the hotel car park. Almost two decades later, when Lily and I were reminiscing about our childhood exploits at Grandma's house, my younger sister Kara chimed in. Although she had been too young to remember the house, she still heard about the family legends. At the time, Kara was newly graduated from SHATEC, the hotel catering college in Singapore. Her friends in the hotel industry had told her that on certain floors at the Karen Hill Hotel, the housekeeping staff would only work in two-person teams. Many of the staff were believed that the hotel was haunted. If there were lingering spirits, any arrangement would be with the family who owned the property. Perhaps they were earth elementals who protected those who belonged in their territory. But it seemed to me that they had reserved most of their harassment for males. In the years that followed, whenever I return to Singapore, I have been greeted by a changing cityscape of new buildings, each addition eroding even more of the old nostalgic charm. Recently, I went with Lily for a stroll down memory lane along Karen Hill Road. We had even climbed up the hill to the site of the old school located nearby. It was strange how many of our memories revolved around the area. I never visited the Karen Hill Hotel in the 20 years it was in business. It was known for its coffee garden and buffets. The hotel was pulled down in 1999 and replaced by a high-rise condominium at the Karen Hill Circle. It would be interesting to know if the current residents ever experienced anything weird or inexplicable. A cousin told me that it is the local custom in Singapore for religious leaders to cleanse and bless the land when it is cleared for development. As Lily and I strolled along that particular stretch of Cairnhill Road, everything seemed perfectly normal and placid. The shadows were only shadows. Hopefully, all restless spirits were finally at peace. But there was an old, weather-beaten house at the far end of Cairnhill Road with a small, raggedy, overgrown garden. It had a dark and broadening feeling to it. Something about it made me give it a second look and passing. For a moment, I thought one of the shadows had moved. Thank you for listening to Mix in the Dark. I am your host, Mai Ying. Mix in the Dark is available on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast series. If you have a story that you would like to share, please send it to mixinthedark at gmail.com. If there's a story that you really enjoyed, feel free to hit up my tip jar on Venmo. Just search Mix in the Dark on the business tab.